Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of John Adams and the focus is president. Unfortunately for John Adams, the day of his inauguration, the focus is not on him. The year is 1797, it's March 4th, and it's the first transfer of power in American history. And while Adams is being elevated as the second president of the United States, the focus is all on the first, the father of the country who is taking his leave of public service, and of course that's George Washington. So even on Adams' big day, his inauguration day, the focus is still on somebody else, which is sort of the story of John Adams' life. Adams' presidency is really focused on one issue, one topic, and that's France. This is the wake of the French Revolution, and France and Britain are at war again. And the United States is caught in the middle. Both nations are trying to deny their enemy access to trade. The Americans rely on trade with both Britain and France, and American shipping is being attacked by both countries. The Washington administration forges an agreement through the Jay Treaty in the late part of his term that actually takes war pretty much off the table with Britain. It's not a very popular treaty in the United States, but it does help uh, take war off the table. Not such an agreement in place with France. And those depredations against American shipping are continuing, and there is pressure to actually declare war because in many ways war has already been declared by the French. They've, a, they've captured some 300 American ships. And so the Americans are feeling, well, there's a war going on already, we're just not fighting in it. And so they're pushing Adams, advocating that he look for a declaration of war. And then it gets worse. Adams learns that the new minister to France, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, that Washington had sent, is not going to be received by the French government. In fact, they tell him, you need to leave the country or we're going to arrest you. This is not a good moment. And when Adams and the United States, the Americans learn of this, there's an uproar and again, more calls for war. John Adams calls for a special session of Congress. This is very serious. He's just two months into his term, and he tells Congress such attempts ought to be repelled with a decision which shall convince France and the world that we are not a degraded people, humiliated under a colonial spirit of fear and sense of inferiority, fitted to be the miserable instruments of foreign influence and regardless of national honor, character, and interest. They have inflicted a wound in the American breast, it is my sincere desire, however, that it may be healed. Adams is offended like his countrymen. He's preparing for war, but he's also keeping open the possibility of peace. That last line, he's hoping it may be healed. And this was a balance that he tried to keep throughout his term in office. Now, preparing for war for Adams meant the Navy. He believed that the most important part of the military response for the United States from a safety and a defense standpoint was to have a much more robust Navy. In fact, he convinces Congress to add a new cabinet secretary to, the, to the, his group of advisors, a new branch with a secretary that Adams nominates, his friend Benjamin Stoddart, to take on that role as the first secretary of the Navy. But while he's pursuing that in preparation for war, he's also looking to restart negotiations. And he picks a couple of people to send to France, Congressman John Marshall of Virginia and his friend Elbridge Gerry. Gerry's controversial. He is an anti-federalist from the opposition party, and Adams' supporters aren't fond of this choice. But Adams trusts Gerry. They've been friends for a long time. He wants kind of a balanced team. He is not going to change his mind. So Marshall and Jerry head off to France, they pick up Pinckney, they head uh, into the French capital, and they go to be received by the foreign minister, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. And then things get worse again. Talleyrand insists on a tribute, 50,000 pounds, a tribute before he would even see the American ministers. Now, this was fairly common at times in, in the royal courts, in foreign uh, policy in Europe at the time, but this was a very un-American kind of thing. This was a bribe, and the American ministers were having none of it. Uh, John Marshall is the one who informs President Adams that they refused to sort of play by these rules, and that three different attempts had been made for the Americans to pay this tribute. And Marshall blots out the names of the three members of, of the French government who made these entreaties, and he puts instead of letters X, Y, and Z, 
which turns the incident into being called the XYZ Affair. When this becomes public in the United States, again, another uproar calls for war, Adams' cabinet, the high Federalists, Congress, all pushing Adams for a declaration of war. But they're doing other things as well. They're passing laws. First of all, they stand up a 10,000-man army with 50,000 more approved as a provisional force. And they pass two laws that are very controversial and, frankly, a black mark on the Adams administration, the Alien Act and the Sedition Act. Adams signs both into law. The Alien Act gave him complete authority, a monarch-like authority, to kick out any foreigner from the country that he felt was dangerous in this time of potential war with France. No judicial approval was was appropriate or uh, allowed. It was entirely in the hands of the president, which was a completely, again, monarchical kind of role. Adams approves the law, but he never uses it. So as Adams is often called a monarchist, uh, you have to keep it in the context that this was a monarchical law that he approved, but again, he never enforced. The sedition law, the government does enforce. In fact, 12 times people are charged with writing or speaking in opposition against Congress or the president, which according to the new law was illegal and subject to both arrest, conviction, and imprisonment. The Adams administration does follow through on this, as I mentioned 12 times, clear violation of the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, and yet they go through with it anyway. Another uproar about these laws, this this new despotic Congress that was passing these unconstitutional acts. Who the leader of that? Adams' own vice president, Thomas Jefferson, outraged at these new laws, and he works with representatives in the state of Kentucky to pass the Kentucky Resolution in the first constitutional crisis really in American history. It calls for the nullification of these new laws saying effectively that the state has ruled that these laws are unconstitutional and they are invalid within their borders. He then convinces his friend James Madison to get a similar resolution going on in Virginia. And again, if this is picked up in other states, a real constitutional crisis could be at hand. Fortunately, no other states sign on. And while the law stays on the books for the rest of Adams' term, it, it, it falls into the background mostly after, again, these 12 or so are charged with the Sedition Act, but it doesn't get totally out of control from a constitutional crisis standpoint. Now, Adams has a choice to make. Does he call for war or not? The easiest choice is to call for war. It's very popular. In fact, this is the height of Adams' popularity for a guy who craves adulation and rarely gets it. He even starts wearing a sword on his side to sort of represent this staunch defender of American rights and the military prowess he plans to potentially bring against the French. Very popular. But Adams would almost never go for popularity if he saw a greater good elsewhere. And so a lot of this comes down to his address to Congress, his annual message, December 7th of 1798. Now, the brief tradition at the time was the president would ask his cabinet to to prepare the annual message, and then he might edit it along the way. Adams' cabinet is still mostly leftovers from the George Washington administration. They are a lot more aligned with Alexander Hamilton, sort of operating a mini government in exile by himself in New York. That's where their alignment is, and they're all in for war, just like Hamilton. And so they write up this lengthy message about all the terrible things that France has done and essentially call for war in the message. Adams takes this, he looks it over, and he keeps the first part, but then he pivots. He changes instead of a call for war, he says, and with a sincere disposition on the part of France to desist from hostility, to make reparation for the injuries heretofore inflicted upon our commerce, and to do justice in the future, there will be no obstacle to the restoration of a friendly intercourse. He's calling for a peaceful approach if it's still available. Uproar, again, how could he do this? very unpopular with his supporters, and even his opponents aren't really sure how to react as this was a sort of a surprise move away from what everyone expected to be a call for war. So Adams now has to figure out what is he going to do next, and he gets some input from people that he trusts, including his son, John Quincy Adams, who's a minister over in Europe, 
that, that they believe things have changed. Things are fluid in France and things are changing and that there is a much higher likelihood that an American minister will be received if sent. And so Adams in February of 1799, really without much counsel, writes out a note, sends it to the Senate, and his vice president, his oppositional vice president, Thomas Jefferson, reads this note to the Senate. And he calls for the nomination of William Murray as the new minister to France. He is all in on negotiation to try to settle this. Well, at this point, Hamilton and his high federalists completely break with the administration. In fact, Hamilton goes off the rails and writes a 14,000 word screed obliterating Adams in the public press in an election year. The party is completely fractured. Frankly, Adams' re-election chances are, are shoved aside. Extremely unpopular. But Adams says, I will defend my missions to France as long as I have an eye to direct my hand or a finger to hold my pen. They were the most disinterested and meritorious actions of my life. I reflect upon them with so much satisfaction that I desire no other inscription over my gravestone than here lies John Adams who took upon himself the responsibility of the peace with France in the year 1800. The fact is that John Adams had trained his entire life for this moment. His upbringing under his father, his work ethic, was always principally based on the idea that he would selflessly look for the betterment of the community, even if it meant it cost him personally. And this was a very difficult decision, critical to his country, and he did just that. He selflessly put the country first. He opted to send a new minister to negotiate to keep his country out of war. In fact, a treaty is signed in late September between the United States and France. War is averted, but frankly, for Adams politically, the damage has been done. Thomas Jefferson wins the presidency, and Adams' uh, uh, political career effectively comes to an end. Now, Adams does have a final few months in office. Those months will take place in Washington, D.C., the new capital, named for the former president who had recently passed away. Adams oversees the government transfer from Philadelphia to Washington, and he does spend a few months there, and he does a couple of critical things. Adams and the Federalist Party, they're going to be off to the side, but they will have a lasting impact on the U.S. government, largely in the form of one person, John Marshall. That minister that he had sent to France, he makes the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Marshall is a strong advocate for a strong U.S. central government. That's how he interprets the con uh, Constitution. And for 34 years, he sort of rules supreme over that Supreme Court, much to the angst of the Virginia dynasty of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, who were to follow as presidents for the next 24 years, Marshall is very much a thorn in their side, and that's thanks to the appointment from John Adams. But he's not done. Congress creates a new layer of courts, an appeals court, in between the district courts and the Supreme Court. And Adams appoints 19 Federalist-leaning judges to lifetime appointments on his way out the door. Some of the most lasting impact of Adams' presidency? Right there in the court system. So Adams leaves. He leaves on a sour note. He leaves early. He doesn't show up for Jefferson's uh, inauguration on March 4th of 1801. He takes the 4 a.m. stage to get out of town. He's bitter about the whole thing. It does not reflect well on him. But his own reflection on his administration was positive. He said to a friend just before he left, I shall leave the state with its coffers full and the fair prospect of a peace with all the world smiling in its face, its commerce flourishing, its navy glorious, its agriculture uncommonly productive and lucrative, O oh, my country, may peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. He was pleased, even though most of the Americans at the time were kind of ready to let him go off to retirement and move in a different direction. The big piece for John Adams, that critical decision about France, as he selflessly looked for the better part of his country, avoided war, and took the pains politically, where he had no chance for re-election after that. He suffered through it, but he was proud and rightfully so of the brave decision he made to keep his country out of war. That is John Adams and President from the life of John Adams. For more presidential chronicles, check out my books on amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.